Hello, New York. How are you guys doing today? You ready for an Olympic underdog story? Yes. Who ra raise your hand. Who wants to hear an Olympic underdog story? Yes. All right, this is Wall Street Journal. It's called this A Miracle Meets Moneyball. And I'm so excited to be here today because you guys represent leaders, really world leaders in healthcare innovation. And so I'm gonna share this story from the Olympic side of things that uses a lot of the same kind of innovation, you know, digital health, big data, uh, quantified self, to help the US women's cycling team beat all odds at the London Olympics. Um, the reason that this story has had so much attention more recently is that it happened at the peak of the Lance Armstrong drug scandal, where you had you know, this whole culture of men's road cyclists who really started believing that the only way to win was by taking drugs, performance enhancing drugs, and the lying and the cheating and everything that goes along with that. So with these guys banned, completely banned from competing in the London Olympics, uh, America's metal hopes really shifted on to the small group of underdog women who were underfunded, underconsidered, understaffed, and who had reached out to us for help. So over the next 15 minutes, I want to give you a behind the scenes look into how all of this happened as we really set out to answer the question, can data beat drugs? So some quick background here. <clears throat> the sport is velodrome cycling, track cycling. You've probably never heard of it. Uh, it has 10 medal opportunities, just very similar to swimming or track and field. Uh, there are reasons that you haven't heard about it over the last decade, and I'll get to that in the middle of the presentation here. Uh, I was on the US cycling team in the late 90s, and Lance Armstrong and all the teammates and everything came out of this group, right? That's Chris Carmichael on the right there. Uh, we had this, you know, that's Lance Armstrong's coach. We shared the same coach. Uh, I was very privileged to be part of what they called Project 96, which was this very small circle of, of people, and it's still the most well-funded project to date to make sure that going into the Atlanta Olympics that we were the best prepared as far as equipment and training techniques. This right here is called the Superbike 2, and it's this radical kind of boomerang-shaped bike. It's the most aerodynamic bike in history. So much so, right after the Olympics, the, the International Committee actually banned it from, from competition. So uh, we had you know, this incredible equipment, and yet we could not understand how each individual athlete was responding to the training you know, as a unique person. So the model was really, you, know, you had this training program that came from uh, Eastern Bloc countries. You know, it was a very, very high volume, very intense, uh, kind of template that was pushed out to all the athletes. And it, it, that system works great if you're taking drugs. Uh, if you're not, you tend to get sick or injured. So you have, there was kind of this division, you know, this chasm that opened up on the team because those that were doping were thriving and the holdouts, like me, of course, were, were not thriving. It was very frustrating and I actually, I retired right after the Sydney Olympics, very, very discouraged. And wanting to sort of put sport behind me, I got a degree, I went to Seattle and started an internet company. And of course, being an athlete, you know, like wanted to immerse headfirst into this startup culture there, which is, you know, all-nighters, 36-hour coding sessions, you know, bad diet, uh, erratic sleep, and it, all of that is kind of like worn as a badge of honor, you know, in the startup culture, right? And it was remarkable to me that all of the, the, the metrics, you know, the KPIs in business are around, you know, customer acquisition, monthly revenues. The, the metrics had nothing to do with the health or performance, really, of the founders or the employees or the contractors. And, you know, coming from a sport culture, I thought that was remarkable, that that, that, that is literally absent. So I didn't do very well with that. The, the company did great. We did 1.2 million the first year. Uh, in revenue, but my health suffered. And two years into it, this crescendoed with uh, a ride to the ER in, in an ambulance. And this was really, it was really scary because no one knew what was going on. I had these chest pains, uh, went into the ER. The, you know, the doctor that saw me 
gave me a CT scan with contrast and blood work, and I, you know, he, in, in a two-minute conversation, you know, he had cleared me for having you know, good health. A two-minute conversation, I sat with this doctor, and he had this list of drugs. You know, here's a drug to get the blood pressure down. Here's a drug to lower your anxiety. And I just, I felt like I was right back where I left sport, right? Like here, take a pill and we'll solve all these problems. And I just thought there's, there's got to be a better way here. And somewhat serendipitously, we heard the keynote the, yesterday from Dr. Eric Topol. First time I had seen him was in San Diego for a TED Talk. And he was laying out this vision for this data-driven health revolution. And he was talking about these new kind of sensors, you know, measuring brain waves for sleep, new kinds of blood glucose sensors to see the impact of your diet. It was all these things that we were missing in Project 96. And have you ever been at a, you know, you're at a conference and you come across a kind of a new concept and you're at the edge of your seat and you're just like, oh my god, this is it, this is it. And I felt like that when I was listening to Dr. Topol. So I, I met him afterwards and decided to do this one-year experiment where I would put uh, health performance above everything else, and fo focusing on sleep, diet, exercise, and well-being, and using you know, as many of these, these gadgets to get feedback. Uh, the question was, would that improve health? Would that improve performance? As a business owner, you know, that's a tough thing to do. Because that means if you have a deadline coming up or if something kind of goes awry, you have to go to bed at 10 p.m. And you know you have to stick to that commitment, and that's a tough thing to do, especially the you know the habits that are built in sort of the startup culture. So, took off into this experiment. These are a lot of the gadgets that I used here, uh, all kinds of stuff from you know sleep monitoring, environment, temperature, uh, mood, and well-being. Uh, and sorry, that slide came early, but basically what I noticed was having all this new feedback was that uh, my health came back. All these symptoms reversed, and I started cycling again. And I was doing times that were faster than when I was in my 20s, which was remarkable, you know, being a 30-year-old. And I went for a record attempt and actually broke the world record um, at 35 years old. And this, this was probably the best thing I did in my entire career because, you know, as the, the moderator mentioned, the previous holder of this record had a lifetime ban for drug use. So that's where, you know, I, looking at this model, I thought, this, there's really something here, because when you put the athlete at the center of the program and you, you build all this data and this feedback around the athlete, and of course, you know, paired with support, you still need that, that human support element, you know, the, the social structure. It's a very powerful, powerful thing. So there would be no Olympics for me because of a funding issue, which again, I'll talk about in a second here. But my old teammate, Jenny Reed, who was a sprinter, she's there, uh, second to the left. She reached out to me and said they were putting a team together, a women's team, and they wanted to go for you know, the London Olympics. And this was three months before the games. And this is <laughs> like, yeah, thanks for the advance notice there, right? Like, not much we can do in three months. But so they were five seconds behind. They were fifth at the World Championships. And there's a very mismatched team, everything from a stage endurance stage racer to a muscular you know, track sprinter. So I agreed to help them. It was my wife and I were going to fly to, to Mallorca, Spain, and spend 10 days setting them up with these gadgets, getting feedback, and then flying home and remotely monitoring. Um, the problem was, and we never could have imagined this, that we got to Spain, and no one was there. They had, there was one, one coach was sent from the governing body, USA Cycling. They had no other staff. There was very little budget. And we're there in this empty velodrome thinking three months to go, like, this is insane. Like, how are we going to do this? When you're going for an Olympic medal, you know, Great Britain, Australia, France, you have a dozen people who are doing things daily, like on the ground, like sports science. You know, you have a masseuse, you have a, you have a cook, because as an athlete, you need to focus on just your performance. A lot of money invested, too, 20 to $40 million per four-year quad. So there we are with very little budget. Fortunately, the, the wives had their husbands there, and they thought, that, they thought they were coming out for a vacation, they were going to relax for a few months as their wives you know, did this intense training. But what we had to do was put them to work. And 
<laughs> you know, these, these guys were amazing. They, they learned how to do the mechanics on the bikes, uh, how to do physical therapy, how to, you know, rub the legs, get the nutrition ready, cook, clean. They took care of, it was a total role reversal, you know, from a typical domestic situation. Yeah, these guys were amazing. So that sort of, you know, you build the base of a pyramid. You think of it like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? You need that, that foundation in place first, and then you can start working your way up. So with these guys, we were able to then focus on the data collection. We were gonna stay there all the way with them to London. Um, track cycling is great because they have sensors in the bottom bracket of the, the bicycle. So you're getting a millisecond per millisecond readout of their performance. And track cycling is a very well controlled environment. You know, the, the lifestyle is, is very well controlled. So you can start looking at how all of these health components start impacting performance. So we started off with um, a genetics test. This is a pathway test. Uh, this gave us a lot of context for all the other tracking that we were going to do. Um, you saw, I was surprised. I mean, you saw the photo of the girls, right? The four look very similar as far, you know, blonde hair. They're all very similar sort of uh, background in, at, at, as far as the ethnicity. But when you look at the genetics test results, they're all very different, very unique. That, that was striking. Uh, blood biomarkers, you, you look for, you know, certain blood indicators. Vitamin D deficiency significantly in one of the girls, probably because, you know, you wear, she wears sunscreen. And this is involved with testosterone and recovery. So we had to immediately supplement, get them sunshine early in the morning to try to get this, this vitamin D up in time before the Olympics. Uh, another thing we did was sleep tracking. This is uh, our beloved Zio, now defunct, unfortunately. A lot of people use the term Zioed, you know, when you kind of get this uh, devices, you go very quickly to market, you kind of go, go too boldly, you know, they, they went into Best Buy, they failed. Uh, a lot of the data actually th from the users just disappeared, you know, the new buyers just took the server offline, all that data was lost. So it's kind of a cautionary tale, but fortunately we were using this before all of that, that, that sale happened. Uh, we were getting really, you know, right from the forehead, getting great, great sleep data. One of the things we noticed was uh, this is an example of declining deep sleep uh, over time. And there's an interesting sort of uh, insight to this that I'll get to in a second. Continuous blood glucose. Again, for the first time, being able to see how an athlete's fuel is going day and night. This is where this passive tracking is really key. Because you're not going to wake up an athlete at 1, 1 a.m. and say, oh, we have to prick your finger for a blood glucose measurement, right? At that point, you've you've disrupted everything. So you're able to see, look at this, overnight hypoglycemia, you see how low that's dropping? That kind of stuff interferes with sleep and with recovery. So when you're looking at naturally, you know, boosting hormones, you have human growth hormone and testosterone are released in that deep sleep cycle, and that's where we really adjusted the diet, protein, sweet potatoes right before bed, and tried to smooth that out, seeing some, you know, dramatic differences. Okay, so we're, <laughs> collecting all this data, environmental data, you know, mood, emotion, physiological, trying to put this together, but we're doing it on this laptop and on a, on a number spreadsheet, right? And this thing literally got to the point where it was locked up. We got this spinning wheel of death, you know, and, and couldn't, couldn't go any further. So what we did is we reached out to this company in Silicon Valley remotely over Skype and just pleaded for help and, you know, hey, can you help us analyze this data? We're here, we're in this tough situation. And they kicked back. Of course, we, we guided them very carefully in what we were looking for. Uh, but they kicked back this amazing, they call a circular relationship diagram, where you're seeing how all these kind of health components are interrelated. And once we saw the connections, one of the more striking ones was how temperature when you're sleeping at night affects your deep sleep, which in turn affects the performance the next day. And so when we, when we had that insight, we immediately um, employed these, these are water-cooled uh, mattress toppers, and you can set these down to like 60 degrees. And so we did this for each of the athletes. Each was, were different, because for one athlete, it would be way too cold. For another, you know, they, they may be sleeping a lot hotter. So when, here's an example of the response. Look at that, the blue, the, the increase in, in deep sleep there with temperature. And you, I mean, a lot of us know this in the summer, you know, it's hot in your room and you just don't feel refreshed in the morning. And so finding that, that right temperature for each person, that's so key. Another thing we did too was 
um, light therapy. This is another, this is a very easy way. It's a, it's a gadget here that shines light in your eyes, a safe spectrum of green light. You can put these on uh, 40 minutes in the morning and anchor that circadian rhythm, which affects sleep, sleep latency later that night. And this is great for traveling and jet lag and all of this stuff too. We didn't have these at the time. We had light boxes, unfortunately. But this is great because you can just sort of take these around with you when you're, when you're doing breakfast. OK, so we're making all this great improvement. We improved a few seconds on their time. What happened next, I think none of us could have imagined. And this was Lance Armstrong and this whole whole drug scandal, the dominoes fell. Turns out he'd been doping for 10 years, making $15 million a year. His teammates were involved. This was structured at a political level. He had worked with a very wealthy investment banker in San Francisco to restructure, actually go to the lengths of restructuring USA Cycling, which is the governing body, to direct all the funding and all the focus towards men's pro cycling. And so what suffered was you know, women's cycling, uh, track cycling. We have 10 medals available every Olympics because of this. So these guys are now out. They're banned from the games. And ironically, the governing body now started shifting expectation onto our little group for medals, because we became the medal hope for cycling for the 2012 Olympics. So, you know, we, this, this was actually very stressful. So here they are, right, taped up helmets and all of this. And you could see, one of the th another thing we did was video analysis. So uh, if you record someone over time and you speed that up, you can really see a lot about their behavior. And we saw this anxiety st and pressure starting to manifest, you know, with fidgeting and some of these behaviors. So again, other tools, there was this um, pulse oximeter by Massimo which is a, a great way to get feedback about how your breathing is affecting your blood oxygen levels. And so you know, when you get nervous, you start like me right now. I'm a little bit tight here. And if you take in that deep breath, you, know, you get your blood oxygen back up. So they would do this deep breathing before the, the, the race, before they would go to the line. And that would really help with a lot of this pressure. OK, so one week to go to London. Uh, we had made progress, but we were still four seconds away from the leading teams. And uh, the bookies, we checked in, it had us at 50 to 1 odds for even being close to a medal, right? Not good odds. So we get on a plane, and we fly to London. And this, again, blew our minds, because we find out that track cycling is like the marquee event for the entire Olympics. You know, you have, it was sold out. You had the, the prince was there, the queen was there, Paul McCartney was there in the audience watching. <laughs> it became like this, the cool place to be. Tickets were going for like five times the price. And so intimidating. See, the, in the middle, you have all the teams where they're getting ready, and you just see these enormous staffs. Um, the, the girls, the, the women, actually had their uniforms brought to them late, and they were all the wrong sizes. And so they actually borrowed their uniforms from the women's road cycling team just to be able to ride, just to be able to compete. So obviously underdogs. Um, they, they do the first ride, and that's where you're getting seated, right? You're qualifying. And at the last lap, they, they fall apart, which is the worst thing that can happen in, in this three-person time trial. They fall apart. Um, but they ended up getting matched against Australia in a semifinal ride to be able to go for a medal, right? So great news, we're, we're, we have a shot at a medal. It could be, it could be gold or silver if, if we win this ride. But of course, Australia is you know, this legend. They have an AIS. They have this enormous budget. They're, they're favored heavily. So even I, I thought, OK, we've come this far. Like, this has been a great ride. You know, this, this is all right. Because, you know, and I, so I didn't think that they were going to be able to do anything here. And sure enough, you know, they get into the ride. They're behind right away. You know, they go at opposite ends of the track. And in the middle of the race, they're two seconds behind, which is huge. I mean, that's, that's an enormous distance when you're going at 40, 45 miles an hour. Um, somehow, in the, in the last lap of the race, they started bringing the time down. You know, it was like, 
you saw the time dropping for the United States, one second, 0.8 seconds, 0.6 seconds, 0.2 seconds. And coming into the last lap, they were head to head, dead even. I couldn't believe my eyes. And the last lap is usually where they fall apart. So the, again, I thought like, okay, well, this is amazing. They made up this gap. There's no way that they're going to stay together here. Somehow, they stayed together that entire last, last turn. They came in, it was still head to head, head to head, photo finish, came across the line, and I looked up at the scoreboard, and the USA was first. We won the ride, and I thought there was a problem with the scoreboard. It was incredible. <laughs> I was like, there's gotta be a mistake here, and we're, we're all looking at each other, everyone's going crazy, right? And they won by eight one hundredths of a second. So you see how small those margins are. It, it really was a, a small miracle, and you know, everyone was just going crazy because just being underdogs like that, you, just, you would never imagine that anything like this was possible. So uh, it was the first medal that the women had won in 20 years. So this really was, you know, this has changed a lot of the conversations around how to, you know, funding women athletes. Uh, the U.S. Olympic Committee since has made a research and innovation fund specifically for this kind of quantified self, uh, you know, bleeding edge, um, you know, work to help, at, to help U.S. athletes get an advantage. And um, there's a feature length film being made about this in Hollywood. Actually, we screened it uh, two nights ago to a, a small group in uh, Chelsea. And I'll t as, you know, kind of emotionally hardened New, New Yorkers, I was really amazed to see so many tears towards the end of the film, you know, when they, when they would capture that kind of win. So what I want to do is leave you with, uh, this, it's an old sort of draft clip that we made um, of, their, of the, the story. And um, we'll, we can take a look at that right now. Digital technologies, supercharged by mobile, will catalyze what he describes as the biggest shakeup in the history of medicine. Dr. Eric Topol. Disgraced cycling superstar Lance Armstrong stripped of his medals and out of millions of dollars in endorsements for years of alleged doping. We're approaching three trillion dollars a year for health care. A trillion dollars a year is waste because of this unmatched. I mean, treatments that induce horrible side effects. We have now learned about a natural way to get high performance athletics. Team USA. Very tight across the line. Because of these tools just now showing up that are so transformative, if we use them, we can really change the whole face of healthcare. What we need to do now is take this to the normal health sphere. That is, in each individual, going to unlock secrets for them. So that, there you have it. Some. I just wanted to thank all of you once again for the work you're doing. This innovation is it's so key. And you see here a bit of the human impact. And we got to keep these success stories going. So keep innovating, keep working hard. I mean, I'm optimistic. And um, again, just thanks for having me today. Appreciate it.